Hey everyone, it's Will Kern from Endless Entertainment, and we are back again. It's hashtag event icons episode 30. Uh, 30 episodes. We've been going fast. The year has been going so flyingly fast. Uh, and this week we have an amazing guest, which let's teach you guys. We, we're we're going to get to him in just a second. But for all you guys that see some new faces out in the crowd right now, in the chat, in the question pane, uh, this show is hashtag event icons. This isn't your normal interview show. I'm not just here to interview Mike and, you know, uh, let him, you know, one way conversation. This is about you, the audience. Uh, and, about doing this 100% live and having fun like this right now. And what's great about it is you, the audience, get to ask the questions. This isn't just about me. So throughout the entire show, over in the question, questions pane, over on the right-hand side, left-hand side, wherever you are, in the question pane, throw in your questions. Let us know what you want to know, and we'll ask them for you. So this is all about you, the audience. Get interactive. Speaking of interactive, we want to make the audience as big as possible so we can get the best questions and have a huge amount of engagement. So if you can take two seconds, just really quick, two seconds, hop on Twitter and tweet out hashtag event icons, tune in event-icons.com, get your friends in here. Or hop on Facebook Messenger and send it over to your best friend and say, hey, check this out. I think this show will be really great for you. We want to get as many people in here as possible, and especially for this episode because this one's going to be awesome. So um, we're ready to rock. I think we're, we're ready to get this underway. So I have to introduce my amazing, amazing guest and amazing friend today as well, Mr. Mike Becker. Uh, Mike is actually, believe it or not, um, we wanted to do a segment on Funco and this amazing event that they've created and how they use events to really drive their, uh, their fanatics crazy and build this huge community that they have done. Uh, and no one other than Mike Becker is actually the founder of Funco. So not only do we have the guy who started the whole company, but we're also the guy behind one of their biggest events they do. So I don't want to steal any of thunder. So if you guys could put together a huge round of applause, a huge welcome for Mr. Mike Becker. Mike, thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> and, and you're calling in from uh, your guys' office in San Diego, correct? Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, Funko South, right awesome. downtown, right across awesome. from the Hyatt where we have our event. <laughs> Yep, yep, that, which is one of the most convenient things ever, guys. So, um, so for, for those who don't know, I mean, I, get, I think I ask this question every other week, is that uh, Funko makes these awesome toys that you probably have seen before. Then Pops are one of the things they're most known for. Their Dorbs are their new line that are becoming really, really popular. And uh, you actually see them there behind me as well. I have a, a huge one. So me as a fan, I'm super excited for this conversation, but also because uh, we're part of their partnership to do all their AV and production for all their big events. So I knew I had to share this story. So let, let's get underway. Mike, can you tell us, you know, normally we do what got you in the events industry, but I know you kind of you kind of accidentally stumbled into the events industry. Can you tell everyone, you know, why you started Funko and how you started Funko? Well, yeah, events industry. I don't even really quite know what that means other than uh, the, out of need, really. I mean, I started Funko because I collect stuff, as you can see behind me. It's a bunch of stuff I got in Japan, and I collect a lot of those silkies, those shampoo containers. But anyway, so I started Funko. It's going great. And I notice there's a bunch of other, you know, knuckleheads just like me that love it, and and people start wanting a place to gather and a place to meet. And I, you know, it all seems cool to me, and but I don't really know anything about it. So we just start by we had made an alliance with a store called Sparky's at Universal City Walk, and the the guy that managed that store said, "Well, why don't we just have it here?" He said, "Sounds good to me. I mean, California is a pretty central location. Let's do it." <laughs> And that's when you started the Fun Days event, right? The the yeah. like the the event that's gotten so big, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But that's the first Fun Days was at Sparky's, right? The very first Fun Days was at Sparky's, along with you know other events. I guess you you'd call them with Mr. T and things that were just planned there at Sparky's. And and what was like what what happened during these events? You know, like were were they filled with like the elaborate entertainment that you have with them now, or was you know what what was like the, your goal with these events? Well, the goal was really just bring like-minded people together, and it was you know it was a real kick to me to see that people would travel to come to this. Like, really, you know, something that I just started in my garage and something that was really just done for fun. I couldn't believe there were people coming from all of the United States and 
and uh, you know it was really it was really foreign to me at first and we the very first events you know we didn't really know what we were doing we saw about a couple of days before we said well why don't we kind of put together a show you know literally two days before hey why don't we dress up in lab coats and be mad doctors that's a good idea things like that awesome and then so you know just to give people perspective, how big was Funko at this point? Was it like, was it year one that you guys decided to do this event? Or was this like a couple years into running it that you guys decided, hey, we're going to do this, this, this fun days event? I think it was, it was either 1999 or, or 2000. And I think we did the Mr. T thing first. I, I can't actually remember, but that was just and where can you tell everyone what the Mr. T story is and kind of like what you guys did to basically, yeah, make this happen? <laughs> well, basically, he was in a mall in Washington State, and he was speaking. And after he was done, I just waited to talk to him. And I couldn't get a hold of him because there were so many people. And I just have to talk to his, his manager agent and got his number, ended up talking to him and say, hey, well, I make these bobbleheads. How, how would you like it if we did one? He says, great. So he was like the nicest guy. It was all one-on-one. -on -one. I said, should we do like a contract? He goes, yeah, hey, whatever you think, Mike. He was like the greatest guy and is the greatest guy. He, um, so I said, hey, you know, this, this Sparky's on City Walk has like, this is like our little flagship store. We have window displays. Do you think you'd ever want to go there and, and just hang out? And he goes, sure, you just tell me when. So, I mean, next thing I know, I fly to L.A. I... I rent a car, I go to Mr. T's house, pick him up, we drive to Universal Studios, we get, we park the car, and I'm walking down City Walk, and I see this huge line going all the way down, I'm thinking, well, gosh, they must have something special going on at the park, right? I'm thinking, like, what, this is going to, you know, take away from our thing, right? I'm, I'm really worried, I'm going, well, I, gotta, I don't want Mr. T to be embarrassed. Then I start going, oh, shoot, this is for us. And I don't have anything except for a little stack of black and white photos of Mr. T, maybe like a hundred. And this thing stretches all the way down City Walk with no promotion at all. And so it, it, it all turned out good and people loved to meet meet him. He, he was he was great. And to this day, you know, I think he still calls Funko. He used to call me and say, Hey Mike, you know, I'm going to the children's hospital. Can you send me another couple of cases of wobblers? He'd give them away to the kids. I said I'll send them, but only only if it's on the house. I, you know, you've been so good to us, and so that was a great relationship. He'd go on Howard Stern, and he would talk. You know, hey Howard, you know, you ain't nobody till you got a wacky wobbler. You know, like from Funko, and he would just do all this promotion for us, and I was just like blown away. Awesome, awesome. Um, so that's kind of like you accidentally stumbled on the events industry, but I want to take a quick step back. You know, I think a lot of people, there's a lot of fans out there, and a lot of people have heard of Funko. Um, but there's still uh, there's still some crazy people out there. No offense, that haven't heard of Funko yet. So can you explain a little bit about what is Funko today and what do you guys you know create and all the different pieces of Funko? Because it's a pretty big company around, right? Well, yeah. Now it's huge. I mean, really, the size that it's grown to today has really not a lot to do with me. In fact, pretty much nothing. I mean, the guy that really drove this thing from being a real small time family friend operation with Brian Mariotti. He really took it, you know, in 2005, I think it was, and really blew it up to what it is now. I, I always, I'm okay with the creative stuff, I'm not the greatest business guy in the world. So, I mean, Funko now, I think pop figures are now known as the number one collectible in the world. And, wow. um, you know, it's got, all, you know, several product lines where I have like one or two, you know, it's got probably a hundred different product lines. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, literally the, the, everything from video games to TV shows to, like, you guys have a, a friends line, like, that you guys have pet, random pets, like, there's, there's one, there's something there for everyone. Do you think that's a huge reason why it's so, you know, broad and so many people like it is because there's something there for everyone? No, I think I really figured out what it is and why we our fans are different. It's really all of us. Like you can see all this stuff. I've got pallets and pallets of stuff I've collected over the years. Brian is a huge collector. Almost everybody at Funco, even the accounting staff, it's collectors making stuff for collectors. And there's some weird, you know, like-minded 
intertwining connection that we all have that makes us do what we do and collect. And so I really just think there's something unique, like it's really collectors making cool stuff for collectors. Yeah, that, that, that totally makes sense. It's like for fans, by fans. Mm -hmm. And then do you want to talk a little bit about, so like everyone knows the pops and you know, they may have heard of the dorbs and they've seen like the, the, figure, the figurines, but Funko now also goes beyond that and that's something that you were kind of in charge of, right? Was going beyond just the actual collectibles to things like t-shirts. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you guys do beyond just the, 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 the toys? So I had, before I started Funko, I had about 10 years in the apparel industry at least. And uh, that's really more of my background. But I had, you know, spent all my weekends and waking hours like swap meets and junking and collecting. And so I got, I got into that, started the Funko, got out of Funko, got back into apparel, started another company called Flophouse, which um, really it just started getting going. And Brian just said, you know, this is... This is ridiculous. Let's just join forces. We want to do apparel. You'd be great at running the apparel. So pretty much here we are, you know, a couple of years later. And so we do all Funko South literally does all the all the apparel, the hats, the lanyards, the buttons, the socks, you know, stuff like that. So my team down here, we do we do the non toy stuff. Awesome, awesome. And then that like stretches now. So like for example, you guys have partnerships with DC Comics and Marvel to be able to ship the like the collectors corpse boxes and the mm -hmm. and uh, the Legion of Collectors boxes. So it's like subscription boxes, correct? Uh, that people get every month too. So you guys are handling all the T-shirts and the boxes and everything yeah. like that. That's going inside that as well. Yeah, that's awesome. all. That's that's my group. And but you know, it's all part of one big family, really. I mean, a lot of times uh, the the other Creative Funko team. Everybody kind of puts in their two cents, so it's not like it's. That's another cool thing about Funko. There's not. It's not really full of a bunch of people wanting to go. No, that's my little thing. Don't you know? We we all share a lot. We all have a lot of fun together, and it's a really neat group of people. Awesome. And what is it? So, for example, one of the events that you guys had this year was that you guys had the big uh, 75th anniversary of Captain America, correct? Uh, mm -hmm. At the at your office. What's it feel like to be able to work with these like iconic brands and you know iconic, I mean images, right? Ever like there's people that grew up with Captain America and it's like they're like their life thing, you know. Like for me, it's like the Flash, right? It's huge. Like, what does it feel like to get to work with some of these big, you know, licensees and uh, brands? Mm, it feels like a lot of work, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but. Uh, um, it's always rewarding, you know. You know what it's like, you know. We we planned this last thing. You and I worked on that for eight months, I think, all total. So, mm -hmm. all this stuff takes a lot of time. And if you don't have passion for it, then it seems like work. If you do have passion for it, it helps you through the real tough times. So there's nothing. People just say, you know, do what you love, and the money will follow, and all those things. You know, a lot of that's true, but there is a lot of work. So you got to have a lot of passion for what you're involved in to get you through those times where you just go, it's, you know, this is too much. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, like, I've said that like a million times because, yeah, like, especially in the events industry, right? Like, you're doing long hours. You're doing weird hours too, right? You're working until yeah. like 3 a.m., 4 a.m. sometimes, and it's physically exhausting. And if you don't have the passion for it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to show really, really quickly. Um, Awesome. So I think now to pivot towards the event stuff, because I think we have we have a lot of I see a lot of iconic event planners, event professionals in the in the chat right now, and I think that they they're really curious to know you know how does Funko uh, use events to connect with its fans, and if you want to maybe talk a little bit about all the different events that you guys are planning, and you know not only fun days but you know the Captain America event, can you just talk a little bit about how you guys use events to connect with your fans? We do them on so many levels. I mean, I do them for my, with my employees. I mean, if you really break it down, you know, events that create, number one, a feeling. I mean, really, when you get down to it, people don't do anything unless they're trying to change their state, you know, how they feel. So whether it's, it's an employee outing or it's something fun that I like to spring on them that we can do as a team or if it's something for, yeah, 17, 1,800 people. You know, I want people to leave that thing really feeling something like, like they were transported for that time, and and they were immersed in into 
this experience where, I mean, to me, that makes it all worth it. If they just came out of there and you really feel like that's that little, that little photograph, you know, in their memory they can keep for the rest of their lives. Like they'll go, oh yeah, that fun days, that was amazing, you know. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then you guys use, so um, we'll, I think we'll probably want to talk about a little bit what fun days looks like too so people can understand because it's, it's definitely not your typical like customer appreciation event. But you guys also do, for example, you guys have the trade show booth that you guys do at all like New York Comic Con, San Diego Comic Con, lots of different cons where you're selling exclusive items uh, and things like that. You guys have things like your your licensee events, so for example, like the Captain America party, where you're, you know, hey, we want to make Marvel really happy for being a partner with us. Um, and then, you know, you guys are also doing, you know, smaller events as well. Uh, are you allowed to talk at all about the event that you guys have coming up next month? Yeah, yeah, it's already sold out. Uh, that was for the. <laughs> it's called the Funko Fright Night, and it's the first time we've done a Halloween event. It was something Brian and I had discussed and. And then, you know, I just, I usually start out with just ideas, you know, and it always starts here and ends up way over here. <laughs> you know, I look back on the original concepts and what the heck was I thinking? You know, it's like, but um, it's just, you know, having fun. Then I'll call, I'll call different guys in. I'll say, well, what if we did this? You know, what if this happened and that happened? And, you know, what if this guy came soaring down out of the roof? You know, let's not talk about logistics or let's not talk about budget. Let's just talk about what if. Like I like to think about like what would be the craziest thing or the most original way to present something and then work it, figure out how it could actually be done. Do, and do you want to talk about, I guess, um, so for example, like with Fright Night, what was the original the concept that you guys had for it and can you talk about how it evolved? Yeah, well, originally it was going to be here in this office for a hundred people that were just supposed to be like random draw people from our board. And then I found I found this incredible church that was built in 1910 um, close by, and the venue was too cool. It was like it was like the main character already. So I saw that and I just go, it's it, it's got to be here. It's got to be way bigger. Um, so it's going to be close to 500 by the time the you know the staff and the crew and everybody's in there. But uh, I always start with like boards. I think maybe you can see these. They're sitting over here, right over there. They're like all sorts of boards, like concept boards and drawings. And sometimes I'll get stuff literally off the internet just to go like, okay, maybe it's this, this. And I like to get all these boards together and then start roughing out stuff from there and then. A couple of my guys actually used to work at SeaWorld, and so they're really good at sketching really fast too, and especially Diego. And so, like, I'll talk to him, and he'll pencil out really quickly, like ideas, so we can get him on the board and start looking at the continuity of the show and how it would work together. And that's kind of how it starts. <clears throat> that's awesome. I, I love the vision boards. I think that's one of the most exciting parts about working with you is that when you, we come together for fun days, we would basically say like, okay, so here's like. Here's Act One. Here's Act Two. Here's Act Three. And here's the 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 you know I like this image from this. We want it to kind of look like this. This is what we want the lighting to look like. And then we just take that all back and we digested it and turn it into what we need to do for the AV. And I think that's something that a lot of event planners who are want to bring on these really creative multi-act shows with lots of entertainment. And man, I mean, you really need to tell everyone what Fun Day is all about. But um, when we have that. It, I think it allows your team to get really on the same page. Like I remember after that first conversation where you pitched the whole vision for each single thing, I sat there and said, I get it, I'm on board, I know exactly what we need to do, versus you set, trying to say technical things, I could a, to translate your vision into a technical need as well, um, which I think was awesome. Um, to me, it's can all, like, especially with artists, and every, it's, always about, it's always about creating these vision boards. It's like... I can't read. I, well, I'm so super dyslexic. My 1.9 GPA, you know, in high school, you know, it's like they never knew what the heck was. But it's like, like I even had to have someone help me read the directions to get on this thing today. You know, it's just it's it's all, it's all about the visual part for me, and so that's really awesome. how everything's awesome. the essence of it. Um, can you tell? I guess I've been teasing everyone because I, I'm pretty sure people are probably like really curious. Um, what Fun Days is. Um, can you kind of explain 
uh, I guess I can kind of explain what it came to when I first got involved with it, um, what it was, and then can you kind of talk about when we first met two years ago and how you wanted to kind of amplify it even more. Um, but four, it was three or four years ago, um, we, we basically got involved with Fun Days. Um, and Mike, I might have lost your webcam there. Um, and I got involved in Fun Days basically to bring in like an AV experience. And originally it was, I think, in the Wyndham ballroom at San Diego Comic Con, and it was just a bunch of lights on everywhere, um, and Brian up doing, you know, the announcements, giving out prizes and things like that, but it didn't have any flair. It felt more like a, a luncheon than it did a, you know, a, a Saturday evening event. Uh, and then so uh, we got involved, brought a bunch of AV and, and entertainment stuff, and if you ever want to see the story of how that happened, you can check out our website. But the next year we brought in, we had brought in AV and kind of brought in a little bit of entertainment, but then we got, and I met Mike, and Mike said, okay, I think we can make this even bigger and better with the entertainment. Can, Mike, do you want to talk a little bit about the entertainment that uh, you uh, kind of brought in that next year? Yeah, well, Brian, I called it two weeks, and why don't we let me produce the show and kind of direct it or something like that. He, he just started laughing, but dude, he goes, what the heck are you talking about? He was kind of kidding, and then about a couple of months later, when we were a couple of months away. Hey, Mike, I think uh, your, your audio is kind of messed up right now, the love of doing a live show. Um, I think uh, your audio and your video might be out. Um, so uh, uh, are you still there? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. It, oh, well, the love of doing a live show, I, you're kind of breaking up right now. Can, um, can you try logging out, logging back in real quick? <laughs> Can you log me in and out real quick? <laughs> so, um, okay, so I'll go into the story, I guess, of, yeah, fun, fun, the fun days and how, like, what exactly. So, uh, basically, it's a fan event that was designed, um, like Mike was saying, originally it was a Sparky's, right, just to kind of get people involved. Um, and I'll let Mike kind of talk, hopefully, about the transition from doing a Sparky's to San Diego Comic Con, which is a very iconic event, as you guys know. Um, and basically... Um, the event is designed that people, can, anyone can buy tickets to this. Any fan, anyone who loves Funko can go and buy tickets for this. You know, I think it's like the first year we we're working on it was like like 60, 70 bucks to be able to come to this event. And what it primarily, I think, the big mo part of it is that they give out a lot of free, really exclusive items. And I think the um, the the exciting part about it is that you know it's your chance to get like a one. Like a one, like a prototype of one toy they designed that you'll never be able to get anywhere else, um, and I think that uh, people go nuts for it. So if you ever get a chance to watch the video on our website, you see these people get on top of the chairs and they start, you know, they like literally are screaming at the top of the lungs. They bring noisemakers, like horns. It gets absolutely crazy, um, and yeah, like people go, it, they go nuts for it. Um, so um, once they uh, you know hand out these toys, they also do some announcements about like new licenses that they have, um, uh, and uh, working on the technical issues while you guys are doing this. <laughs> um, and so they get to announce the new licenses. And in the past, they had about like 300 to 400 people coming to the event. Um, but then after we got involved bringing the AV, we ended up jumping to like 600, 700 people the next year. Um, and then the year that Mike and I got together to do the entertainment portion for it as well, um, it just got absolutely insane. And I don't want to steal the thunder on it, but it's a really, really uh, exciting uh, story to talk about. By the way, I want to take this moment while we're waiting to get technical issues working and the love of doing it live. Um, <laughs> uh, take a second, if you guys can, and on the chat on the right-hand side or in the question pane, Put in your questions that you have for Mike. Ask him about, you know, what it's like to be involved with the company at the ground up. Whatever your question may be, uh, post it in the question pane right now. And when Mike gets back on air, any second now, hopefully, we can uh, definitely ask him that question. So, I'm gonna stop the recording right now. <laughs> All right, everyone, we're back uh, through crazy technical. You know, Murphy's Law, uh, the internet connection went down in Mike's office, um, but we got him on the phone. Unfortunately, you're only going to see me for now. We're going to try to work and get the video up and going again. Uh, but 
at least we got Mike's amazing voice right now, uh, and we can pick up the amazing conversation that we were having from there. And we're going to keep working on the video in the meantime, though. So, um, so Mike, I was kind of telling everyone, you know, where the event. We were talking about how the event was at at 400 people with all the lights on, and it was kind of like, you know, a little stale, right? And then we decided to bring in the lights and everything like that. And then the next year, we got involved um, with you, and you said, "Hey, we can turn this into a show." And like make this, you know, bring almost like what do we end up calling it Cirque du Soleil meets Geek kind of a uh, uh, show put together. Can you talk a little bit about that transition uh, from when when you got involved to turning it into what it is today for Fun Days? Yeah, well, I mean, again, it comes from passion. It's like I grew up, you know, I'm 53 now. I grew up loving Kiss, right? And Kiss was all about the show. You know, it was Fourth of July and Halloween all rolled into one. So for me, it's like I wanted to give people, you know, their money's worth. It's like they were just showing up. We'd have like a banquet type of dinner and they'd hand out prizes and people would be back there, you know, getting a piece of like, you know, like cake or something. You know, it's like it was. It, and so I wanted to bring the characters that we all know and love, you know, to the stage. And so that's, you know, when and then you guys were the perfect company to marry with and, 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 and to bring that stuff you know, the, the ability to bring that to that stage. And I think the biggest thing was, was, was changing, getting those to the people where, where the events got so big that let's add a catwalk. Like that was a big deal because the catwalk allowed the characters and the story to be taken right out into the, in, you know, into the audience. And then it started making me think more about like how we could interact with the audience, you know, more with the catwalk. And then I started thinking more and more about sound and lights and, you know, special effects. And, and so, you know, and then, it, then it started with, okay, let's see, what, what do we want to do? You know, let's do some stormtroopers. Okay, everybody likes those. Let's do stormtroopers. Okay, let's have, well, they can't just walk out. What are they going to do? Okay, we've got to have some, the music. So we got onto the, the original Star Wars soundtrack. I think, I think the guy's name was like Nico or some M-E-C-C or something. And, and we... Uh, we thought it would be cool if they come out, you know, and open the show, have Darth Vader appear from behind the crowd, you know, and then my brother actually did the audio for that, and, and there's some sort of a Darth Vader, I don't know how, how you know, how he exactly did it, but we, we actually had him address the fanatics in that voice, and then we had the actor at the rear of the stage to start the show, and then we had... The, Stormtroopers come out, so that was a, that was our first try. I remember it, trying to, uh, you know, start the show with a bang, like really start it, like it has begun. You know, the lights go off and you can hear Darth Vader breathing, and, and then we got the turtles and we got the Ghostbusters and we got, you know, so it was just getting on the internet and calling favors out and getting friends and. You know, and then thinking, oh, let's have a game show. Let's have a game show, a trivia amongst the fans. And, you know, I, I can't remember what we called that, but that worked out really well. Oh, wow. And so what the, what, when the, so the fans went, you know, we brought it from this experience where it was like a banquet, right? And then we turned it into a show. Do you remember what the fans' reaction was when, uh, you know, we shut all the lights out and then they saw Darth Vader there? What was the, like, what was the reaction to seeing all this? Well, of course, I was like immersed in the evening and trying to make sure everything kept moving and, you know, sweating buckets back there and making sure the the axe and the cues and everything was coming off. But, you know, for weeks, you know, I and still even like with this last show, I hear people always go, I can't believe it. You know, I can't believe what I just saw, you know, or I just experienced. And I even had friends. I live over here in Coronado. You know, I've got I, there's a couple of dudes I hang out with that are like in their late 70s and I told them to come to the show and they, they thought it was the most amazing thing they'd ever seen. And they don't even, they're not even in our world, you know, our comic book <laughs> world. And then, so like it turned into this like, okay, so then now that was going from 400, we had like 400, 500 the first year to like 700 and I think that year we went to like 800, 900 people, right? Yeah, it jumped up along with the popularity of Pops and mm -hmm. the visibility of Funko and then the need to, to want to be part of that event. And then I'm sure you're going to get to this is, you know, this year's or yeah, this year's event, what happened 
I don't know if you want me to talk about that. Yet. Yeah, tell, tell us what. So what happened this year? It went from like you know 800, 900 people, and we wanted to take it to the next level. What what did we do this this last year? So as you know, you and I and my team and Johanna's team started planning this thing about literally started having our first meetings about eight months out, and yeah. when the and then to fast forward a little bit to when the tickets went on sale. I think it was 1,600 tickets sold out in two minutes, and all total we had, I think, almost 6,000 people on the waiting list. So, and I believe I, I don't I don't didn't handle that part of the ticket sales, but the uh, I believe the tickets were 100, 125 bucks, and so I mean that's like going to see Paul McCartney or something. I mean that's mm -hmm. like that's that's not, but I mean they do know that it's more than just a seat, you know, and the experience you get it you get it some killer prizes. That's the thing, Funko likes to really keep bumping up uh, the amount of prizes, the quality of the prizes, the quality of the experience. And so we knew the year before that, man, what are we going to do this year to top? So now we're already thinking, um, you know, we're already thinking for next year. We're, we already talk about this. We all go out to lunch. We say, well, hey, what if you know, what if Spider-Man, you know, blank, blah, 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 you know, did this? Or, and so this year, you know, as you know, we had a massive script and we had massive cues and <clears throat> you and I and your team had massive meetings, you know, about every little scene. And uh, now we're all trying to figure out how we're going to top, you know, next year. Yep, yep. And I, th I think that's one of the interesting things is that, you know, as your fan base has grown, also this event has grown. What would you say is the the num like? You know, everyone's always wondering how do we get more butts in seats? How do we get more people to attend our event? What do you think the secret has been to you guys being able to have six thousand people? Not only just like say like, oh hey, I'm uh, I'm interested in going to this event, but being on a wait list to get it, the next one ticket that's going to be available. Why do you think that you have been able to sell so many tickets? I think it's twofold. I think it's the prizes, and I think it's the show. I, I, I really do. I think that we've been able the the buzz about how cool the show is, and the experience, and all the things we'd hope to achieve about giving people their money's worth. I mean, geez, I think from start to finish, the show's over four hours. Yeah. From the time you get in until the time you leave, and that's with us cutting things in the show, as you know, during the show, or it would even be longer. But <clears throat> I mean, there's so much to see, so much to do, there's so much to experience and that's the way I like it. I like I like things coming at you from all directions and you know sights and sounds and and, and uh, you know I learned a lot from going to this dinner theater in Seattle it's called Teatro Zinzani and everything takes place inside of this really vintage Russian circus tent and you know the waiters and the waitresses and everybody is kind of in on the act and and it was done so well that I always was so intrigued. I probably went to the show 20 times. So I'm re that's what, you know, I don't want to spoil anything for Halloween, but anyway, <laughs> or, for or for next year. So you're um, pulling, like, a lot of inspiration from, like, different locations and different other events as well and bringing them in and almost weaving them into your event. Yeah, it's dinner theater meets, you know, Kiss, meets a, meets a rock concert, you know, because of that. So it's... And as you, I mean, our fans are, are probably just as crazy as, you know, I come from the Northwest, so Seahawk fans are known as the craziest, loudest fans. There was a time during the intro of the show this year where I was thinking, this is louder than a Seahawk game. It, it was. It was. <laughs> we were like, man, like, like, we were just all trying to figure out, like, how could, could like, could it get, it's going to get even louder next year, right? Um, so, obviously, you know, like, so this event has grown and grown and grown. What do you think the hardest part about planning? So you know, Funko fans are like you guys call them fanatics or fanatical about your guys' brand. What do you think the hardest part about planning an events for fans that have such high expectations of your brand and you know they're looking for the best of the best and you know maybe they attended last year they're looking for that next big thing. How do you keep you know managing those expectations and planning for those events? Um, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, Walt Disney said we're always going to keep plussing and plussing. That was the term he used. 
uh, on Disneyland. And it was, he said Disneyland will never be finished. And I think that's the way I feel about fun days. You know, it's never going to be like, well, we got it down. That's it. We'll just repeat this show next year. And we're going to, you know, insert this character instead of this character. It's like I, I, I feel like we have to top it. Like we have to double it. You know, every year we have to double it. I don't know how. That's what we said, though, two years ago. But I felt <laughs> like, we, like we did this year. You know, I really did feel like we did. And so I want to double it. You know, I want to give a better experience. I want better prizes. I want, you know, you know better tre treats, you know. <clears throat> I, I just, I want people to just be blown away. And I, I, I'd actually like to. You know, I've got to. Uh, it's not, you know, my final decision, but I would, I would love to be able to offer the show to more people. Like, I would like to be able to offer it to, you know, two nights at least. You know, so uh, someday I'd like to, to, to have it be, uh, you know, like Funko on Ice. Who knows? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think that's the the great thing too is that you come into it too with this idea of like anything's possible. And then we figure out and, you know, bring it down from there, or build it up from there. And I think that's always great for an event planner to have is that, like, desire to be like, you know, let's blow people's minds and do something awesome. And we'll figure out kind of the details a little bit later. Um, Cody O'Malley actually has a really awesome question for you, Mike. Um, he asks, um, how did you come up for with the idea of selling products in the form of a show? So turning kind of like the, you know, originally you were selling just the bobbleheads. And then now you have created shows for people to attend. Um, you know, is it, you know, like how did you come up with that that idea to to start selling, you know, your show as a product in itself? And also, I guess probably even selling products at the shows because I'm guessing even in the early days you guys would sell toys at the events too. Yeah, well, it goes back to my golden rule, which is is. The passion and the feeling. So you're really, it's about the feeling. For instance, you're not really taking a Count Chocula bobblehead or a pop and sitting there and playing with it all day, right? What you're really selling is the feeling. You're selling, oh, I'm, I'm in front of the TV. It's Saturday morning, cartoons. I'm, you know, I'm sitting there eating a bowl of Count Chocula or Lucky Charms. I'm watching Anna Barbera. And so the toy makes you feel like a kid again, let's say, or it gives you that feeling. You know, the show, I want them to be surrounded by their childhood heroes and friends and favorite movies and experiences. So we're really, it just, again, it, 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 maybe that sounds cliche, I don't know, but it really just comes back to the feeling and, um, and the rest seems to take care of itself. So would you say that you rely on feeling over detail and logistics and things like that when you're playing an event? Like, for example, the, feel, the, the feeling you get when Darth Vader walks on the end of the catwalk and all the lights go out. Are you planning around the feelings you want and then figuring out the details from there? Yeah, and, and, and I, go, I rehearse it in my head like 24-7. It drives my wife crazy, actually, because I'll, I'll, I'll get a, a piece of music and I'll, I'll help play it on my phone in the car over and over and over again and I'll say like okay so just think about this for a minute I go I go what if you know up in the opera box the girl's singing and then you hear this and this guy appears here and then I'll, I'll think about just that one piece over and over and over again and then and, you know maybe a week later I'll go okay none of that works throw it out you know so I, I really just try to figure out I do think about it logistically how, how it's going to be able to be pulled off because I mean, yeah, would I want the actor to fly through the air and high-five everybody in the crowd? Yeah, but that's not going to happen, you know. So, I mean, I try to think of how am I going to – I do think of logistics, but I, but I try to build it around the emotion of, like, surprise or, you know, or, or something that I, – I love that surprise or I like using music a lot or sound effects that enhance – you know, it feels like it enhances the experience. Do you want to talk a little bit about like how you do involve music? Like, how did you guys involve music and media? Because I think that's one of the important aspects of the event. Is you know, Fun Days is such a multimedia related show. It's not just actors going up in microphones. There's other things involved in it. Do you want to talk a little bit about like the media and how it integrates to the whole show as a whole? Well, yeah. I mean, I. 
technologically, I'm I'm you know an imbecile, but I I did grow up. You know, I was in several bands in the '80s, and that's kind of how I got into this whole business. So I I come from the '80s, like you know that whole Duran Duran video age, doing videos in bands and all that. So. I, I, I see that direct connection between you know the fashion, the video, the music, you know, or, or or the costume, if you will, and and how that all works, you know. And so, I know that again, I, you try to bring in as many things that that, that involve your the senses as possible, whether it's you know sound and sight and smell and feel and touch, you know, everything that you can possibly bring into an experience. To make it seem more real to the crowd. Awesome. Um, what do you think the biggest challenge that you guys are going to have moving forward with all these events? Do you think it's going to be selling more tickets, or do you think, you know, like, what would you say is your you guys' biggest challenge moving forward with all of your events? Well, the biggest challenge, obviously, now is it's gotten so big. It's either we got to add dates, or we got to. It's gotten to where we or need to to just scale it back a tiny bit in terms of the amount of people to give the to give everybody you know a hundred percent of of the experience so people aren't going to be like stuffed in a back corner and they can't see or hear properly it's gotten to that level and and so I want I'd rather personally I'd rather do two or three nights and and have the crowds be slightly smaller so so I can put on a, a little bit more intimate show Interesting. Do you think that that's part, you know, like that, that uh, I think a lot of them struggle with that, right? Like, for example, you looked at U2, right? When they decided to do the 360 tour, put their, but they realized we want to do arenas, we want to do tens of thousands of people, not just a 2,000, 3,000 person night. And they ran the issue of intimacy. Do you feel like, you know, do you think that all events require intimacy at some point to be able to, you know, like you're saying, scale back and, do you know smaller nights, or do you think that there is a place for these massive crowds? I guess I guess there is a possibility of doing. I mean, we've even discussed the possibility of some things about doing a four or five thousand seat type event in in a smaller arena type thing. And again, that would have to be a full on you know Cirque du Soleil meets Kiss kind of show. It would have to be a full on rock and roll extravaganza, you know, in order to reach that, I mean, we're, we, you're going to have to get into some pyrotechnics here, you know, we're going <laughs> to. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it, Mike. <laughs> um, I think one of the questions that has popped in my mind is that um, I guess not a lot of people know how this show integrates into San Diego Comic-Con. A lot of people have heard of San Diego Comic-Con. You know, it's been, it was one of the number one largest Comic-Cons in the entire country for the longest time. Um, and, you know, it's still probably the iconic show that everyone goes to announce the new movies and everything like that. But your guys' show is like a sub-event inside of that show. But, you know, how does it, you know, integrate into the event? Do people have to uh, attend, San do they have to have passes San Diego Comic-Con to go? Or, you know, how does it integrate into the larger scope that is San Diego Comic-Con? Well, initially it just made sense because a lot of people came to Comic-Con, so let's have our fan event there because, you know, they're already going to, a lot of them are going to be there, they're going to come to our booth. But now it's a lot of people go to the show that don't even go to Comic-Con. If you can believe that, so, and we also had for the first time this year an independent pop-up shop here at our Funko South building. So, and that would be I'd pull up in the morning in my car, and the line would be around. I mean, literally around the block, and people start camping out for the next day. It, it, it's in. It's just insane. I mean, we saw everything you saw this year. We even had a wet uh, a marriage proposal on stage. You know. Yeah. Uh, insane is absolutely insane. <laughs> I think it's interesting, like you said, people don't. I think that's something a lot of people understand about San Diego too. Is that to go to the event, you don't actually have to have tickets to the event, and that's why I think it makes it so big. You might have twenty, thirty thousand, forty thousand attendees in the actual convention center, but really the set sixty thousand of them are all outside doing the various different activities, going to the pop up shops and things like that, which is absolutely crazy. Um, we have another question. Um, so, uh, Joan asks, um, it doesn't seem that the revenue from the tickets covers the cost of the event. 
Um, are there any expected other like revenue streams that you guys take on, or do you guys consider this a, a, just a purely marketing event, and you you just are doing it for the exposure? Can you talk a little bit about you know how you guys made that decision to what what what's the purpose of the event financially? Yeah, we we don't make money; we lose money. Um, it is about branding and it's mainly about giving back to the fans like we really do feel fortunate to be where we're at and we really have a blast putting on a show for our fans it, it, it's really that simple it's, there's no no other motivation other than like let's just go out there and even if it costs more than we make who cares let's just do it it's also a chance for a lot of the people that we we do business with you know Disney you know and, Warner Brothers and you know all the various people that we have licenses through to invite them to come and see the Funko experience and then they get to see and it helps us they get to see like wow this is for real this isn't you are a different type of company here no other company that I know of no other toy company I mean that I know of has fans like this I really don't I mean I know people are I mean people go to the Star Wars Fest or whatever and people are darn passionate but that it, and so I mean there are companies like people love to collect Barbie or they love to collect G.I. Joe but people do love to collect pop but they're really coming here as what they call themselves as Funko fanatics it's not just about a product line it's about this Funko feeling and madness that somehow has grown and grown and it's it's one of the coolest most giving groups I've ever seen there's people that'll hand over things that are worth a lot of money just to another fan just because they might have two or they want this guy to have it because that's what he collects and it's really a neat crowd I've never seen anything like it they're just so giving that's awesome that's awesome um, and kind of talking a little bit about the the product lines I mean we have a lot of the uh, uh, you know meeting planners event planners event professionals tuned in right now but you know not often do we have someone who's actually a company who creates products too uh, Cody had the question of how many different products is Funko like you know created to date can you like put a number on it at all no it's thousands now <clears throat> I used to put out two different characters a month I, I mean I, I wouldn't doubt I have no idea I was just talking to Brian about this we were laughing about it. I mean I don't know I mean maybe they put out a hundred different a month I know 200 I don't know it's so many because of all the segment of the different product lines and characters and the distribution so big I mean I have no idea um, it's crazy I mean they give you I guess like an idea of how many there are so I have a, a figurine back there. It's the Zoom character. I think came out like three months ago um, for the Flash TV show, and its number is 352, which means it's the 352 second uh, create like product. But that's just for the Pop Television line. So that's just Pops that style and just the television show. So that just yeah, like you said, Mike. There's 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 thousands. I mean, like every day it feels like there's a new product being launched every day. So, um, so Cody's follow-up question to that is, you know, when you're developing so many different products, you know, is is there any adversity that you kind of like run into with it? Like, is there a point where there's too many products, and you know, like, do you guys ever see that sort of problem pop up? The hardest part in product development is um, approvals. Um, it's really approvals because, of course, we want to push the envelope and we want to try to do. Uh, character design or outfits or sculpts or things that, that, that are really you know as, as, as far as you can push it so you know things gotta they, they need to be approved you know Funko I think the reason why pops are so popular is the fact that they're not really on model you know they're disproportionate they've, they've got those button style eyes and they're not technically on model and so that was a big thing to for, for Funko to, to overcome and to get approved and across the the finish line with a, with a lot of the licensors because uh, that and it was just a huge hurdle that was never I mean back when I first started that was a it was a problem just doing bobbleheads interesting very interesting um, so I guess switching now to like if we put our you know our futuristic you know uh, goggles on that allows us to see into the future 
where where do you see the future of Funko going? You know, is it it you know? I'll just leave that open ended. Where do you see the future of Funko going, Mike? I'm continuing to branch out into things that aren't just toys. Um, that's about all I can say. Um, <laughs> but uh, in, lip sealed. <laughs> continuing to just try to add, um, doing new things. I think we're getting our audio and video back, aren't we, Demas? I think so. Let me just. Uh, Ooh. <laughs> yeah, back. Let's there we go. go. Okay, <laughs> hang on. <laughs> In the last couple of seconds. Um, all right, and we're back. So, uh, yeah, so Mike, you're talking a little bit about the future of Funko, and you see it branching off into, you know, different product lines and different things other than toys. Where do you see, you know, you talked a little, a little bit about it as well. Where do you see the future of Fun Days going as well? Well... I, again, just trying to plus, keep plusing and doubling what, what we did the year before, and we got to figure out what that means and how to do that, and just add more value, more more fun, <laughs> more fun and fun days. I, I mean, I guess I don't. I guess that just means a better experience. And for, I'm already writing down notes, and when I see Brian and Johan and Yoko, we already start kind of talking about like how can we make things better from the from the start to finish, which includes getting people in the door, you know, easier. Not having it, getting people from the lobby to the main event hall easier. You know, every little detail, you know, from what we're going to give away to the food, to the drinks, to the, you know, how big the stage is going to be. Every little detail we try to continue to make better. Awesome. Awesome. Very cool. Well, um, we only got a couple more minutes left. I know you're super duper slammed. We got some stuff to get to as well. Some more uh, planning for fun days and the Halloween event that you have coming up. So uh, I'll end it on these last two questions that I have for you. So the first question that I have for you is uh, if you had one tip, and you can only pick one, maybe two. I'll let you do two. Uh, one tip that you could give event planners today about making their event planning process easier and better and making their events better, what would be your one tip for event planners be? I guess start early, way earlier than you normally would think to plan the event, and then have a backup for, like, for instance, make sure that you're not relying so heavy on one particular thing for that for that show. That if it, if that something happened to that one particular thing, that. that that the show could go completely wrong. You know? So don't rely so heavy on one act or one trick or one effect or and plan way early and have contingency plans. I guess it's just all about really pre-planning way in advance and do a little bit every day. That's the thing that's a lot of times, you know, it's like your book report, you know. It's like you know, it's like, you know, I always waited till the last night, right? And then I ended up trying to do it while I was eating my frosted flakes in the morning. You know, and it's like if I would have just done, you know, 15 minutes every night for the two months that they gave me to do it, it would have been easy. And that's kind of like the event planning. And it gives you time to work through the scenarios for months instead of like a week before. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. I love the, like, the put all, don't put all your eggs in one basket. And, yeah, do a little chunks along the way because, yeah, it's, it's always easier to do a small task versus one big task. That's awesome. Um, and then I guess the last question I have for you is, do you have any cool resources or tips or tricks that you want to share with the audience as far, or, you know, any resources, like a favorite book, a favorite event, uh, a new movie you saw, any tools that you use, any kind of resources that you want to share with the audience? Well, I personally, I probably watch 10 documentaries a week on Netflix or whatever, Hulu or whatever. I watch a lot of documentaries, and that seems to give me a lot of ideas because it gives you a lot of insight on various things from music documentaries to, you know, historical documentaries. For some reason, that helps the idea process and helps me think of things for shows and events. Awesome, awesome. What would you say is your, like, your favorite documentary that you've that you recently watched? Hmm, let's see. I think it was called September Issue. It was about a Vogue, Vogue, Vogue magazine. 
putting together their their September issue and very interesting. Awesome, awesome. Um, any other cool resources that you want to share with the audience? Any other cool like uh, books or anything like that that you read? Well, I don't read books. Um, <laughs> So, so I always just, you know, I travel a lot, so I just try to take in, you know, with visual stuff, always visual stuff. Like if I see a great painting on the background, I think, hey, wait a minute, what would that look like if it was on a big screen? Or what would that look like on a map, you know, or a projection unit on that wall? Like it could be, you know, like, like well, I almost spoiled the surprise for the Halloween party, but... <laughs> Basically, I saw, you know, so I try to get out and see what, what's going on. You know, you can get an idea from, yeah, a football game or a nightclub or, a, you know, by just keeping your eyes open and thinking about it. I, I love to do it. It's my favorite thing. The event stuff and putting on shows for people, the people experience is really exactly what the toys are because the toys were supposed to give people experience. And I used to love to go to the, the trade shows and, and the comic cons and see people's reaction when they'd see the toys. So that's really just an extension of all that. Awesome. Awesome. I love it. I, th I think the idea that you're playing on having people open their eyes and kind of see everything that's around them, I think there's inspiration around all of us today. And I think that's um, super duper helpful because a lot of times we get trapped in just looking down on our phones or, you know, being immersed in what we are used to. So looking out and kind of keeping your eyes open is really awesome uh, advice. So, that's all the time that we have today. So I have to wrap up the show. I want to give a huge, huge, huge thank you to Mr. Mike Becker for joining us today, the founder of Funco. If we could get a big virtual round of applause for him. Uh, Mike, thank you so much for being on the show. All right. You're welcome. Awesome. And for all the, everyone who's tuned in right now, you're going to want to tune in next week. We have an amazing episode. I'm not going to give it away, but it's going to be really awesome. So be sure to tune in next week, event-icons.com. If you're signed up on and watching right now, you can actually get an email every single week letting you know. Don't forget about the episode to watch live. If you aren't watching live right now and you're watching us on the recording, man, I really wish you were here live. But all you have to do is click on the bottom to register live, and you'll get an email every single week to tune in live and uh, enjoy the show and ask these amazing icons like Mike your questions as well. So we will see everyone next week for another episode of Event Icons. But for now, we must say goodbye. Bye, everybody. Mike's doing his virtual goodbye. He's waving as well. <laughs> Bye.